I think it's well worth remembering that Kant, although we think of him nowadays primarily as a philosopher, was also in his early days fascinated by cosmology, fascinated with questions about time, fascinated with, with the question whether we could produce an overall theor theoretical description of the whole process by which the material universe took on its present form. Um, in fact, his first major work published in 1755 was called The Universal Natural History and Theory of the Heavens. Uh, and it was an attempt to take Newton's theory and use it to generate an overall and complete set of hypotheses about how matter distributed uniformly or randomly throughout the universe would, by the action of Newton's laws, come to form stars and planets and nebulae and all the rest. And a lot of the ideas that Kant threw out speculatively in that book actually came to play a part within physics in later decades, in later two, 200 more years, as uh, questions which have been dealt with and which have thrown light on processes that astronomers have been very much concerned with. But what happened was that after reading Hume, Kant became very embarrassed about the question how he could justify the very arguments he was using in that book. I mean, it seemed to him, for instance, that when you stop to think about it, questions about the beginning of time were questions that were inherently constructed in a way that was confused and confusing. For instance, if I try to, sell, t try to tell somebody about the fact that time had a beginning, the, naturally, the natural thing for them to respond is, and what before that? But if one's talking about time having a beginning, presumably one's trying to mean that there wasn't any before, that, that the question about before doesn't arise. And then you get into the same, uh, then you get into the same kind of confused difficulties that you get into if you start thinking about the absolute zero of temperature as being, um, as having a particular numerical value. Because it's not obvious at first that minus 300 degrees Celsius is an inherently confused um, description of a temperature. Um, and indeed, you can perfectly well construct an alternative scale of temperature in which, based on the logarithm of actual temperatures, so that absolute zero will go off to minus infinity. And if you chose to have a particular kind of time scale in astronomy, you could define it logarithmically so that the beginning of time was minus infinity. And in fact, the distinguished English physical cosmologist E.A. Milne, in the years just before the Second World War, put forward a very complex physical theory, according to which, in his view, for, for certain theoretical purposes, we should think of time precisely in that way as not having a beginning for the same reason that a logarithmic scale of temperature wouldn't have a lower bound. All of this Kant put forward in a famous argument in the Critique of Pure Reason, in which he describes what he calls paralogisms. Paralogisms are arguments in which we use terms that are inherently bounded and then get into confusion because we want to think our way beyond those bounds. And when Kant explains what are the, what are the limitations of our natural modes of reasoning in the critique of pure reason, what he, the point he makes is that reason, among other things, has to discover the limits of its own applicability. Now later, Schopenhauer said that these limits were the limits of representation. And later on, Wittgenstein, in the same sequence, said that these limits were the limits of language that language has its own inherent self-limiting character in the way in which representation had had for Schopenhauer in the way which reason had for Kant. But in any case, if somebody asks, when did time begin, we have to make sure that he understands what he's asking and that what he's asking 
is, is, is something which may turn out to make no sense unless he's been very careful in the way in which he explains and defines what he means by uh, coming, you know, by, so to say, running out of time backwards. And this isn't always done. I mean, there are many physicists who talk about what happened in the first uh, millionth of a second of the history of the universe in a way which leaves us still unsatisfied by the sense, as a result of the sense that it always makes sense to us and before that. Uh, which if Kant, if we'd taken Kant's warnings seriously, we would have known, we would have known was a trap that we were putting ourselves in a position to fall into. <laughs>